So I'm, I'm not sure whether I'm full of butterflies today. I'm very confused whether it's the baby or the butterflies. Um, so um, let me start. The bicycle. Uh, I hope this works. Oh, no, no, no. That's the wrong. No. Okay, it wasn't at the beginning. The bicycle. It was blue. This color blue. Uh, peacock blue. It was a two-wheeler bike. Uh, blue handles, blue pedals, blue everything. And at the time, I was about five years old, and my brother, he was about three years old. And uh, my brother really took to this bike. He was on it. Up until that point, we'd only been riding around on, on little tricycles that were very stable. But this bike, being a two-wheeler, it had training wheels, but my brother got used to riding it around, and they were pr pretty quickly, dis uh, we got rid of the training wheels pretty quickly. And uh, it took me years later, um, many more years before I learned to ride my own two-wheeler bike. When I had my own, it was pink with tassels and all that sort of thing. So a couple of years ago when I asked my mother, um, I was talking with her on the phone, said, do you remember that blue bike? I was wondering, why did you buy that for my brother? I mean, he was younger than I was. How come I didn't get my own bike? She said, what are you talking about? That, that bike was for both of you. I'm like, but it was blue. I thought that was a, I thought that was a boy's bike. <laughs> so to my horror, I realized that even from a ripe old age of five years old, I already had these invisible biases that were holding me back from doing something that I was curious about. And my mother, of course, never asked why I wasn't curious about learning a two ride a, a two-wheeler. So I was wondering how many of you have had this same experience. You've had an invisible bias that's been a barrier to, and it's held you back from exploring something that you were curious about. So um, today, it's called Curious Courses Day, and maybe it's a stupid question to ask this, but who here in the audience is a curious person? <laughs> is there anybody who's not a curious person? <laughs> okay, so <laughs> it appears we're all curious people. So if we're all curious then, what makes the difference between somebody who actually steps forward and activates their curiosity more than others do? Some of us are more, appear to be more curious or take more action in our curiosity. So I want to show you something. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a little bit about curiosity. So, um, I was wondering what kind of questions might have been going through your mind when you saw that. Are you still curious? <laughs> Would you be curious enough to step out of that, that cockpit <laughs> that you saw? Um, so, I have my own opinion about why some people appear to be more curious than, than others, and I have a feeling that it has something about um, our uh, risk aversion and that perhaps sometimes we prefer not to explore our curiosity because of the 
uh, we'd like to avoid the risk of a bad outcome. A bad outcome could be anything from, oh, I might hurt myself, I might get injured. Or a bad outcome could be, could be as simple as, I might spend a lot of time and effort and money doing something that was a waste of time, and it would have been just easier to stay at home. So that's just my opinion about why some people might be more curious to, to take action. So in my life, um, I have a mentor that helps me with my curiosity. She's uh, a very young mentor. <laughs> She's here today, actually. <laughs> She's my daughter. And um, to give you a bit of an explanation of why she's my mentor uh, in curiosity, I have a few stories to tell uh, about things that have happened in the past. So uh, some years ago when we were living in Sweden, um, my daughter was crazy about sushi. She was always asking, can we have sushi? And, um, but the, the Swedish town that we lived in was very small, so it only had two uh, sushi restaurants. Both of them were very expensive, good quality, but expensive. So we said, oh, honey, yeah, sure, we'll have sushi, but maybe on a day where it's a special occasion or, or something. <laughs> so uh, it was a birthday coming up, and we decided, oh, honey, you want to go to a, a, a restaurant for your birthday? It would be nice if you have something, something nice to eat for your birthday. And we assumed that she would simply choose either that restaurant, or that sushi restaurant, or that sushi restaurant. So, yeah, sorry, I'm not very good at moving my slides. Um, and in, but instead of mentioning either of the sushi places that we recognized, she said, oh, can we go to the place that has, like, there's some kind of white dragons at the front? And we're like, you mean the one with the stairs? I mean, really, this is the place. This is the actual place. <laughs> Um, this is not a sushi restaurant. <laughs> we said, you mean the one with the stairs? Isn't that like a Chinese restaurant? We've never been there before. She said, yeah, that's why we should go there. I'm like, oh, okay. So she's choosing the unknown over her absolute favorite. And she kept doing these sorts of things. Like there was another time we were waiting on the, the platform at the train station. We had a long time to wait for the next train. So she was busy doing her homework. And I saw that there was a, a Starbucks across the other side of the tracks. So I said, yeah, how about you wait here, you keep doing your homework, and I'll head over and I'll get us a treat. Uh, shall I choose your, your favorite drink or shall I get... Uh, she said, no, surprise me. Like, are you sure about that? <laughs> Maybe I choose something that you really don't like and don't want to drink it at all. She said, that's okay. I trust you, Mama. <laughs> And so the bit that I was impressed about, not that she was saying, oh, I trust you, but rather, holy cow, there she goes again. She's choosing the unknown over choosing her favorite. And there was one time I asked her something about, oh, what's your favorite color? She said, it's purple. And I said, I thought it was green. She said, oh, Mama, you can have more than one favorite. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> so the, the real lesson that I was learning was, Look, sometimes you have to choose the unknown over your favorite. Otherwise, how are you going to find more favorites? And you can have more than one favorite. <laughs> so, uh, what else did she do? <laughs> um, she also pointed out to me um, that sometimes my attitude sucked <laughs> where it really didn't need to suck. <laughs> so, for example, one day we were going to the, the dentist and uh, she's skipping along, as happy as ever. And I'm like, oh, we're going to the dentist. <laughs> I don't want to go to the dentist. It's, you know, a horrible feeling when they're cleaning your teeth. They use those horrible, uh, scratchy, scrapey things. And uh, it feels awful, like, you know, fingernails down the chalkboard. And I was saying to her, like, wh why, why would you like that? I hate going to the dentist. It feels so yucky when they scrape your teeth and the fingernails. And she said, oh, yeah, I know. Like, well, then why would you be looking forward to going to the dentist? And she's like, well, because afterwards, when they're finished, it feels so good, they're so nice and clean, and they're nice and white. And, okay, so the revelation to me was, oh, yeah, okay, so you can't always change your... She was busy focusing on... Uh, uh, sorry, I was spending all my focus on the horrible experience, the uncomfortable experience of going to the dentist. She was spending all her focus on the great outcome there was to look forward to. So the realization I had was 
you can't always change the situation, but you can change your perspective on it. And that's what she helps me to, to see in the most unexpected times and the most unexpected ways. So, ugh, enough of dentists. <laughs> okay, so, <laughs> who wakes up in the morning and decides, oh, I want to become a wing walker? I mean, like, walk on the wings of the plane, like what you saw. <laughs> not me, that, that's not me. Um, but uh, I'll tell you what did happen to me. Uh, some years ago, I was in love with a, a gentleman and it was not working out, so I was in this huge heartbreak. I was very upset and I could see my weekend coming up. It was just going to be full of misery and being alone and feel, feeling very sorry for myself. And it just so happened that this weekend that was coming up was also my birthday. And I thought, oh, maybe I should organize a, a party and have friends around or something. So I was calling my friends, and, but a lot of them were going to be away. Uh, they were ab abroad or somewhere else. And I thought, oh, no. <laughs> okay, I'm really going to be alone. So um, I was speaking to a, a, a friend, and he said, well... Look, you could always go throw yourself off a bridge or that dam, you know, the big one <laughs> in Ticino. I went, ah, oh, the Fasaska Dam, right? That's the one that they used in the opening titles of the 007 film. You know, when James Bond does that big bungee jump, I'm like, oh, that's such a beautiful looking dam. I really wanted to see that sometime. Yeah, maybe I could do that this weekend. I went, well, it would be pretty melodramatic, wouldn't it, if I go throw myself off the bridge? But, um, you know, I would have a bungee cable, so I wouldn't have to die <laughs> doing it. So uh, I, I got on the phone to see whether it was open and whether it was possible to go there. And I uh, got the operator, and she said, yes, yes. And I said, and they, they do bungee jumps as well? And I said, yes, yes, what time? And she said, yeah, we have a, a space at 2 o'clock. I'm like, oh, okay. Uh, okay, I put down the phone. I'm like, did I just accidentally book myself a bungee jump? <laughs> and I thought, well, it would be fun to do. I mean, James, I've never been interested in uh, bungee jumps, but James, James Bond is pretty cool. I would I'd love to follow in his footsteps. So I thought about it, and I went, I don't know. I, I don't know about this. I'm, I'm, I think I'm going to have to call her back to, to cancel this. I thought, well, let me see. So I called a friend, uh, somebody else. I said, Look, I think I've accidentally booked myself into a bungee jump this weekend <laughs> for my birthday. Would you be interested to come and join me? <laughs> and she said, oh, yeah, I'll come with you. That's, uh, like, really cool. I'm not going to jump. And I said, <laughs> <laughs> all right, but would you hold the camera for me? She said, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll hold the camera for you. I, all right, okay, so let me think. So the next morning I woke up and I said, oh, this is nuts. What am I doing? I, I'm not sure that I... Okay, well, let, let's just see. We'll, we'll just go down. I mean, I can always cancel it. And, you know, it costs a lot of money, but, you know, it's my birthday. It's time to splurge. So we go down to Fasaska. It's a beautiful day. And, uh, of course, everybody is having fun jumping off. And I'm like, I'm, not, I'm still not sure about this. And then, finally, they start to prepare me, and they put the, the shackles on my ankles. And I went, well, they look okay. They look like the hold. Um, <laughs> I thought, this was quality. I'm not going to die from this if I jump off. <laughs> so I'm finally there. I still haven't really figured out whether I'm going to do this. And, and they said, all right, oh, it's your turn. I'm like, oh, okay, okay. So I'm standing at the edge going, uh, all right. And they say, so jump. <laughs> and I'm like, just a sec. Just give me a second, okay? <laughs> and my whole body is just saying, step back from the edge, honey. It's really dangerous. And my brain is saying, you're all prepared. It should be okay to go. So, um, I, I jumped. <laughs> it's, it's really
the next year, when it was my birthday, my daughter uh, was kind of push pushing me a little, saying, you know, we saw that stuff called body flying. Somebody gave us a, a pamphlet some time ago about how you could go indoor skydiving. And I thought, oh, this, this looks attractive, it's interesting, um, safer than jumping out of a plane. Um, but uh, also seeing the price, I went, oh, come on, um, okay, uh, honey, we'll try this, but someday, okay, <laughs> not, not today. Um, but being my birthday again the following year, I said, well, this is the time to, to splurge, step out, try something a little bit extra. Um, so I said, well, let's do this for, for, for my birthday, make a nice excuse to go. So uh, I called up the same friend, actually. I said, we're going to go to body flying. It's um, where you uh, fly on the air from a huge fan that blows so hard that you can balance on, on the air. And uh, would you like to join us? She said, oh, I'll come with you. I won't go. I won't do the body flying, but I'll hold the camera for you. Like, okay, no worries. Off we go. Um, so we tried this, and uh, my daughter and I, we liked it. Uh, we tried it, and actually, we loved it so much that we said, okay, we have to come back. <laughs> We want to come back and we want to learn to fly properly. So we actually went back and um, took lessons in um, body flying and, and learned to master how to, to fly in a vertical wind tunnel. And we've tried this a few, few different places around the world when we've had the chance. So the following year, uh, my birthday again was coming up. And I was speaking to a, a different friend, friend on the telephone. And this particular friend is a very adventurous type. He's a skydiver. He's a, um, a hot air balloonist. He's had businesses around the world. He's a really extraordinary guy. And he said, well, I know what you did for the last couple of birthdays. So what are you going to do this year? I went, oh, I hadn't really thought about it, actually. But uh, it's a nice tradition, actually, to make an excuse to use the birthday to do something uh, a little bit different. I said, do you have any suggestions? And he said, mm, well, you do um, aerial silks, so you know how to climb, you know how to hold on to things, um, and you're accustomed to the, the wind blast, you know how to balance on the air. I think wing walking is the thing for you. <laughs> like, wing walking, are you serious? <laughs> He said, yeah, I've got an aeroplane, it's a, it's a biplane, it's in New Zealand, and you could do it on that. I'm like, I'm not going all the way to New Zealand to learn how to, to wing walk, that's crazy stuff. I, 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 that's, that's crazy stuff, okay? And I said, anyway, why would I want to do wing walking? He said, oh, well, there's very few wing walkers in the world. Well, okay, <laughs> it's kind of attractive. <laughs> And I said, but still, that's crazy stuff. I mean, that's the stuff that you see in the old films and, and whatever. So, um, but you know, the next morning I wake up and I'm wing walking, huh? I wonder how that works. So I still wasn't decided, you know, I didn't, hadn't woken up saying, oh, I want to be a wing walker. But I thought, well, I'll just look into it. I'll see what it involves and what preparation it takes and, and that sort of thing. So I looked online and uh, wing walking, it, it Google, it, it, wasn't turning up anything that was useful. I mean, you couldn't just book yourself a training like the, the bungee jump or something. And um, so I actually had to get in contact with a few uh, professional performers and they said, no, 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 <laughs> we don't train anybody to do wing walking. There's no such thing. So um, then I got in contact with somebody in the UK who said, yeah, we do some activities, but they're like Breitling guys or whatever. Mm, but there is a guy that we know in the US. Uh, you might want to contact him. So I got on the phone and found out this guy. I think he's probably the, on the only pilot in the world who actually is willing to take on students to do wing walking. And he's on the west coast of the US. So I thought, well, all right, let's, let's find out more. I discussed it with him. I said, what does it involve? How do you... Uh, what's required? He said, well, good weather is required. <laughs> um, and that won't be around for another nine months because it has to be the summer season, season when it's very stable. Thought, well, I've got time to think about this then. And um, I spent that time um, online reading, uh, watching a lot of footage, watching a lot of crashes, 
of other wing walkers, professionals who died uh, doing this, and actually examining the footage, saying, well, what happened? What went wrong? What were they doing? What were their thoughts? Was it the pilot error? Was it a conditional? Was it a mechanical failure? And I even looked up things like uh, crash investigation record, uh, reports uh, about why uh, wing walking got banned in Australia, which my friend witnessed when she was in high school. And um, when I read about it, I understood more about the mechanics behind it, what's required, what the power of the plane is, uh, what the maintenance of the plane is. So I started getting, you know, I was really investigating what it took to, to do wing walking safely. So much so that I said, all right, I'm willing to, to book a flight to go over to the US and meet this guy, the, the pilot. And when I met him, I felt... I felt pretty good with him, actually. I had to kind of assess, is he a real cowboy? And no, no, he's a, he's a really good guy. He's got a family of five. This is a serious business for him. Safety is absolutely priority for him. He doesn't do things the same way as other pilots because he wants to do it in a more, more safe way. And um, so with him, I said, all right, well, let's, let's do a bit of training. And um, I did the rehearsals and was climbing up and down the, the aeroplane again and again uh, to rehearse what the moves would be, what, what we do, and how to communicate with the, the pilot, what the routine is. Um, and so um, that took some time and then woke up the next morning. We go out to the, the tarmac, which is actually a grassy field, and uh, the pilot looks at me and he says, so are you ready? <laughs> and I was looking around saying, it's a good day, conditions are clear, I've pretty much done all my risk assessment, everything's good, situation's good, I know what I'm doing, I've trained, I've rehearsed, I know what's going to happen next. So I turned to him and I said, yeah, let's do this. <laughs> and that was the final moment that I actually decided that I would <laughs> go on my wing walk. So um, at that point, we strode out to the, the um, steerman, the, the biplane, and we took off. People ask me if I know you. I tell them it's true. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, there's a lot more. We did loop to loop and all that kind of stuff, <laughs> hammer hits. <laughs> um, so, today is a, a special day. Um, uh, you're here uh, to explore your curiosity, and I hope that I've given you a little bit of food for thought about how you can encourage your own curiosity. There are some tools that you can use. So, for example, as I said, beware of the blue bicycle. Think about whether maybe you have some invisible biases that may be preventing you from exploring your curiosity. Um, uh, maybe change your perspective. Realize the situation can be the same, but um, change your perspective. Uh, find mentors, surprising mentors. They don't have to be gurus. It can be your own daughter or <laughs> kids. Um, and what else? There was one other thing. Step by step, you don't have to take one gigantic leap. If you, there's something that you're interested in, you can take a small step at a time until you get there. Nobody else knows the difference. You know that you've taken 100 small steps, but they just see one giant leap. <laughs> so, um, yeah, today is your day to get to explore your curiosity, and I hope that you'll take advantage of that. 
And I'd like to thank uh, Selena very much for inviting me here to, to speak to you today. Thank you.